All right, guys. So back really quick with a example, right? I want to walk you through that example for the homework assignment in case you're staring at this and going, oh my gosh, what is, what are all these zero or what are all these, you know, what's this graph all about? What's the A, B, C and the, and the B, five and the two and all that. What are these questions? What's this hill climbing algorithm? I don't understand what's going on. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to walk you through it, right? I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through the questions and why the answers are um, what they are. Okay. Um, and let me just start off by explaining the graph in case you're, in case you're wondering, in case you're curious. Now, what is this graph? Okay. This graph is the state space. Okay. So this is a graph of all of the potential states. Okay. So this is, you know, a graph of kind of what you built for, um, the uh, missionaries and cannibals, right? Um, and keep in mind, this isn't representing what you would have in memory, you know, before this algorithm begins. This is the potential for what could end up in memory, right? The different nodes that could end up. This entire graph worth of nodes will not be in memory at the same time. It's not how it works, okay? So hopefully you, you, you uh, caught that from chapter three, is that the search generates the nodes, dynamically allocates the nodes, creates the nodes, whatever, in memory, as it progresses. Okay, and with the hill climbing algorithm, its benefit is that um, it's gonna generate overall fewer nodes. They don't have to stay in memory. You don't reconstruct a solution at the end when you've hit your goal node, right, or your goal state, like you did with, say, breadth first search, right? And each node had to keep track of, you know, the memory address of the node that spawned it, of its parent node. So that way you can kind of do that backwards, um, traversal from goal to root and then you know, pulling out all the actions that, that, that led you there. You don't have this here. With the hill climbing algorithm, you're just trying to find a state that has the maximum value, okay? And that could be, you know, a state where all eight queens on the board aren't attacking each other or a state where all the different pieces of a motherboard are arranged optimally or, um, you know, all the different machines on the factory floor are uh, arranged in the best possible configuration. You don't care about going from some start space, say an empty factory floor, to a finished state where you have all of the different pieces of machinery laid out on the factory floor in some optimal way. You don't care about, oh, well, first, first action is move that machine into that corner. Second action is move that machine into the middle of the room. Third act, you don't care about that. All you wanna know is what's the final state of the room. Okay, and so that's what these algorithms are trying to trying to determine. Okay, so okay, so let me get back to the graph here, right? So this is all of the states that could possibly be generated as the search progresses. That makes up your state space. Okay, and um, so in that state space, of all the possible um, states that could get generated. Okay, um, what? state has the best value. Now, each one of these is representing a node that's storing a state and um, what its evaluation is, what the evaluation function values it at. So, you know, the A comma five, this is state, A is the state, and then five is the value, okay? Now, state A, I'm just using generic terms. It could represent, it could be representing whatever, missionaries and cannibals. It could be representing, you know, some bit string that represents the arrangement of, um, you know, uh, rides in an amusement park, whatever, you know, the, the queens in a particular, um, particular configuration on the, on the chessboard. Okay. So A is just representing some state. B is some other state. C is some other state, right? A is one configuration of queens. B is another configuration. C is another configuration, whatever. Okay. And then the numbers are the values of those um, states. Okay. Now, of all the possible states that could be generated, which one has the highest value? Okay, we'll take a look at the, the valuation here. Which one's the biggest? P, right? That has the biggest value. So our global maximum is P, right? Because it has a value of 22. That's why that's the answer. Okay, the algorithm hasn't even, we haven't even looked at that yet. All we've looked at is what are all the possible potential states and which one has the 
best value, right? That's your global maximum. Now, what's the global minimum? The opposite, okay? So, you know, I said, I think in the example, I said, if you got some kind of tie, uh, I think it resolved it by alphabetical order. I mean, check the, check the description, right? I don't, I didn't copy that part, so I'm sorry. Um, but if there were ties, then you'd go with, you know, whatever the lowest, um, you know, where it came in alphabetical order. I think that's what I had on there. But anyway, there's no ties here. So the global minimum would be um, D. Okay, um, now, are there any plateaus? Okay, now, are there any plateaus? Not along the path of expansion, right? Maybe I should have made that question four so it'd be a little bit easier to see. Now, remember what a plateau is. Okay, when we saw that, or when we had that graph that looks something like this, okay? Um, if you had a situation where you had a flat part of the graph, that was an example of a plateau. Okay, now what does that represent? Okay, in the search or um, in the search or in the state space. Okay, this line, this overall line, is the progression of the search. Progression of the search. Okay, now at multiple places along this search, these are nodes that are getting expanded and valued, right? So maybe this is node. Um, node uh, x right and uh, its value is one right and then the algorithm progresses and you move on to um, a neighbor node which has a value of five right and then from there you move on to a neighbor node which has a value of 12 and then you move on to a, another neighbor node um, maybe i shouldn't have started with x to y and z um, w which has a value of uh, 15 right but then its neighbor has a value of um, or Q has a value of 15 right so since you the node that you expanded and its neighbor node that gets expanded successor node have the same value that forms a plateau okay so we'll come back to question three to answer that there is no plateau along the path of expansion okay now in what order are the nodes expanded now expanded generated Okay, those terms can be, you know, depending on what you're talking about in the text, they kind of use them interchangeably from time to time, or maybe I do in the videos. Okay, that just means, you know, what nodes are you generating? Um, are you dynamically allocating? Are you creating in memory uh, so that they can be examined? Okay, that's all that means. So if we have a starting node, and here I said um, starting node has state A. Okay, well, that's this guy right here. Now let's look at the algorithm, okay? And it says that it's gonna take problem. Now remember what problem means. Problem is just all of those things that the algorithm needs to be able to run, right? In, in previous uh, algorithm, previous chapter, it was, you know, the uh, results function, the actions function, the goal test function, okay? Um, so here, it's just gonna be, you know, make node, okay? So that's all this thing's really going to need, right? Now, um, I say that, but, you know, what's not included here, right, uh, maybe because they just want to be as concise as possible, is a, um, well, I mean, I say that. The, the, the make node here, that make node function would have to have, um, well, they could have been a little bit more, they, this could have been a little bit more clear, right? As part of making the node, we have to have some kind of a value. So that way, this right here can be evaluated, right? Now, it's kind of implied in this, in this uh, pseudocode that that value is um, accessible, right? So this could have been generated by, you know, a heuristic function, could have been generated by make node um, as part of, you know, it's logic, I mean, it, whatever, you have to have the value of each state accessible, okay, as part of the problem definition, right? So we start off with our first state. Here's our first line. So current could be something as simple as node star current, right? If you're talking about um, C++, or if it's Python, current. <laughs> Right? 
um, or if it's Java, node current. Okay, whatever. Hopefully, I really hope by now that you've learned to translate pseudocode into actual, um, you know, computer code, right? Or, or, or Java code, C++ code, whatever. If you have it, yeah. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. That's something you should have learned how to do by now. Um, but anyway, so make nodes a function. You pass it some state, so you can imagine that it looks something like this. Node star current. Here's a C++ example. Equals make node. You know, and then you know whatever represents that initial state, right? So you know state A, right? Or whatever your representation is of the state of the state. Right? Maybe it's uh, A. Maybe if it was missionaries and cannibals, you know, you used um, a C string, you know, and you did something like MMM, C, 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 you know, what, whatever. You know, maybe you had a vertical bar here to represent the river. Um, okay, however, right, I'm just trying to give you some context here within the language. So you got to start off somewhere. So a node will be generated. That is going to create a node in memory to get you started off with, and current's going to be a pointer pointing to it. Okay, so now from there, it says here, loop do neighbor, highest valued successor of a current. Okay, so again, we got some implied stuff here. You have to figure out who your highest valued um, successor is. Now, from state A, okay, from state A, there's the possibility of moving into or transitioning into two different states. B or E, okay? So in the previous chapter, you know, this would have been what the, uh, what the results function would have spit out, right? By feeding it actions, okay? Um, but these are our two successor nodes from A, okay? So state B, state E. Now the evaluation function would tell us that B was worth two, right? And that E was worth uh, six, okay? So you could say, well, that those, those temporarily, as this thing, as this, as this algorithm is progressing, you know, maybe both of those are stored inside of a vector, right? Temporarily, because as soon as we're done with them, they, they're gonna leave memory, we don't need them anymore, right? We pop them out, we could pop them out of the vector. Right? Or we could clear the vector. That'd be even better because you just delete the entire thing. But anyway, so these are our neighbors. These are our successors. Okay, so now here's where loop do pops in or comes into play. Okay, so what does loop do do? Okay, well, take a look at this first line right here. Okay, so what that does is that says, all right, well, who is our highest valued successor of current? Okay. So the highest valued successor of current is going to be that node that has the highest, that has the state that has the highest value, right? So you'd have to go through this vector, you know, run an algorithm to find the, you know, find the highest value in the vector, right? We've, that's, that's CS201, right? Um, so who's the highest value? The one that's E, right? So there'd be a pointer to E. And then um, the next line kicks in, says, well, if neighbor value is less than the current value, right? Well, what's current's value? Five, right? Is neighbor's less than that? No. So then the if statement doesn't evaluate the true, so you don't return. Now, as soon as this is true, you return the current state, right? And that's when the algorithm is over and you found a maximum. It may be the global maximum. It might not be, because notice what this says. It just says, that if the current node's value, right? If that is bigger than the biggest neighbor node's value, you're done, you found a maximum. It could be that current is pointing to a node that makes up a local maximum and the biggest adjacent node or the biggest neighbor Right, the current's got a value of 10, um, and then your two neighbors might be four and eight, right? But the global maximum is valued at 22. Well, you didn't find 
the global maximum. You found a local maximum, but you're stuck because the algorithm would terminate at that point because your biggest value damper is only worth eight, and so you would return, right? And so that's kind of a problem with this and why the textbook goes into developing additional algorithms to try to get you past um, this current or this uh, local maximum or, you know, get you off this plateau, right? Because this could be your current node right here that has a value of say 10. One of the successor nodes has a value of eight. And then the other successor node has a value of 10, right? So at that point you would return, right? You're stuck on the plateau. You're not gonna go back, right? And you can't go forward. So you're stuck on the plateau. And so you would need to somehow be able to work yourself off of that plateau. And that's what some of the algorithms were trying to do. Right, so the simulated annealing algorithm being one of them, or random restart. Okay, all right, so anyway, I'm ahead of myself. You know, I'm getting a little bit further than I needed to, uh, a little bit more complicated than I need to do here. But anyway, so that if statement is going to evaluate to false. Okay, so then you move to the next line, current is uh, becomes uh, the neighbor, right? So when that happens, Right? This pointer is now pointing to that node. Now at that point, at that point, the um, B2 node can go away and the A5 node can go away. So both of those guys can leave memory at that point, right? If it's Java, then you just set their pointers to null. If this is a vector of pointers or references, just clear it. Right, and then they'll leave memory, or if it's, um, or if it's uh, Python, you know, in your in your um, successor list, you know, is, is uh, you call it L or whatever, you know, you could just set it to you know an empty list or something, um, or whatever, okay, because uh, you don't need them anymore, and that's 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 one of the main advantages of this algorithm is that you're minimizing the amount of nodes that you have to have in memory at any time. Okay, and so we're back in our loop. Now, going back to answering this question right here, given a starting uh, node containing A, what are the uh, order of nodes being expanded, right? So what did we expand first, A? In other words, in what order was, um, you know, the make node function being called, right? Um, in what order were the states being generated? Okay, so we went A, and then we went B, and then we went E, right? So start with A, who are the successors? B and E, right? Now, the algorithm continues, okay? Current is now pointing at the node that contains E, state E in it, okay? And so then it repeats, right? It's a loop. So who are the successors from E? Oops. Who are the successors from E? Well, E's successors are um, A, F, and I, right? So their pointers, their references, etc., could be placed into a vector for further evaluations. Their values would have to be evaluated, right? So um, we'd have five for uh, a, we'd have um, 3 for F, and we'd have 10 for uh, I, right? So let me go back up here and uh, put my order back, right? So A, B, E, and then after E, we've got A, F, I, right? Because A, F, I, okay? Um, now at this point, you know, we have to figure out of all of our neighboring states, those successor nodes, which one has the highest value, right? We're back to getting the neighbor with the highest value. Now, who's the neighbor with the highest value? I, right, because it's got 10. So we got ourselves a little pointer to that node. And is the neighbor value um, less than or equal to the current value? No. So guess who becomes our new current? <laughs> I does, 
right? So from there, once we've done that, then we can clear our vector here. Okay, and all those guys will leave memory, except for um, I, because current still got a reference to that node. Okay, and then we keep on going, right? So I loop again, who are all the successors of I? Um, so all the successors of I are E, J, M. So E, J, M. E, J, M. What are their values? E is worth six, J is worth 11, and um, M is worth nine, okay? Now, do any of them have a value that is smaller than the current nodes? No, so we continue on, right? We get past that if. So we got ourselves a new current, which is gonna be J, okay? And um, we go back up to the top of the loop, right? Now figure out who all your neighbors are again. So who's getting expanded here? Okay, so we've got um, F, right? Because we're going in alphabetical order for, on, on here for sure, right? So F and then I and then K and then N, right? So J, okay, and then F gets expanded. These are all of our successors. I'm just drawing this a couple different ways for you, just, you know, so in case one way doesn't click, you know, maybe another one will. Um, N and I, right? So now we have at most these four nodes in memory at any one time, okay? So then a reference to F, I, K, N could be in a vector of references. You go through and search the vector for the one that has the, the best or the highest value. Which one is that? Um, well, K has got a value of 15, right? So that would get our N pointer pointing at it. Uh, is that value smaller than the current nodes um, value? No. Uh, so we're not done. And so our new current node becomes node K, okay? So let's clean all that up. And then the algorithm continues on, right? So from K, we have to find the neighbor with the highest value. Okay, now who's all the successors of K, right? Well, there's G, J, L, and O. Those are all the successors, right? And so we'd be back to having five total nodes of memory at that point, okay? And the references, the memory addresses for G, J, L, and O can all be in our list, inside of our vector, inside of our array, whatever container you decide to use. And then you figure out, well, who's got the biggest value, okay? Well, the biggest value there is uh, L, right? Because it's got 12. So that is assigned to the neighbor pointer, reference, you know, variable. Um, and then we kick down to this if here. Well, is neighbor's value less than or equal to the current node's value? Yeah. It is, right? So this algorithm's over. So what do you do? You return current state. So what was the current state? K, right? So the algorithm identified K as being the best node, right? Now, was it? No, right? Um, because the way the algorithm progressed, we hit a local maximum, right? K the value of 15 is the local maximum. P with the value of 22 is the global maximum, but we didn't get a chance to get there because all of the successors had a smaller value than, um, than that, uh, or than, our, than the node that we're currently examining, okay? Um, so, you know, when we went to, uh, J, right? I'm trying to go back here and fill this out, right? So uh, just to speed this up so I don't have to backtrack, right? So you can see that F-I-K-N, F-I-K-N, and then the order in which the nodes were added to memory were J, J, G, J, L, and L, okay? Now, the order of nodes that were actually chosen 
right? Which ones became all the currents, right? So the list of all the currents. Okay, the list of all the currents was um, A, E, I, J, K. Okay, so the path that was taken through the state space, okay, was A, E, I, J, K, right? Because these are all of the nodes who had a turn at being the current, okay? So maybe I should draw that line right through here. A, E, I, J, K, right? So now if we want to draw that graph, okay, what do we have? Okay, we've got A, which was valued at five. We got E, which was valued at six. We've got I, which was valued at 10. We've got J, which was valued at 11, right? And then we've got... Um, K, which was valued at uh, 15, right? And so that's a local maximum because that's where we got stuck, okay? Now, if you could go downhill, we came from 11, right? Now, if we were able to keep going, if we were able to keep going, let's say we were able to keep doing this, right? There is a path that goes that way, okay? But that would require us to go through a node that's valued at 12. And then from 12, you could go up and find your global maximum of 22, right? This is why it's called hill climbing, because you go up, you always try to pick the next node that you're gonna examine based off of its value, right? That's gonna be your next node in the progression, okay? Now, if you get caught like we did at K, that's a local maximum. Did we find the global maximum? No, that's question five. The algorithm is unable to find the global maximum. Where did it get stuck? It got stuck at K. Why? It has a value of 15. And that node has a greater value than all of its neighbors, right? 15 is greater than nine. 15 is greater than 12. 15 is greater than five. 15 is greater than than 11, okay? So this is what I'm looking for for the homework assignment. And this is just forcing you to hand trace through the algorithm, applying your understanding of what's going on to be able to answer these questions, right? And then by answering these questions, you're demonstrating that you understand what's going on. Hand freaking tracing. <laughs> Right? This is something that I freaking emphasize in all my classes, and so many people ignore it, ignore it, right? This is not just for finding logic errors. It's for figuring out algorithms and how they actually work, right? If you don't know what I just did, what have you been doing for the last three, <laughs> three years? Or, I mean, I say that. You know, I say that. Um, but it could be, I mean, because the uh, CS201... Uh, textbook, right? That Gaddis textbook. It's a chapter three thing. And they never really talk about it again, which is maddening to me. Um, and then in the Python textbook, they don't talk about it at all, right? Which I just don't understand because it's one of the most important skills that you um, can have. And in all my classes, I always stress it because that's how you build debugging um, techniques. And it's also how you um, Learn algorithms, man. It's how you can double check that you understand what the heck's going on and also that you understand what code is doing. Okay. But anyway, sorry, I got on a little tangent there. Got on a little rant. Um, so I just wanted to, the purpose of this video was to walk you through the example in case you were lost there and weren't sure exactly what I was looking for. Um, but, you know, that's, that's it. And if you understand how this works at a fundamental level and you can do this, then the other algorithms that follow this um, are variations of this to try to get you unstuck from those plateaus, say, or, um, you know, to do parallel searching where you can, you know, start off, you know, where you can have different multiple threads. Oops. 
right? Where, you know, um, you could be running this in parallel where one thread starts off here, right? And then another thread starts off with a current over here, right? Call that C0, call this C sub one. And another starts off over here, right? And then all three of these threads are progressing through the search until eventually, hopefully, they converge, right? Onto, a, onto um, you know, the global maximum, if, the, if G was the global maximum, or maybe one of them can find the global maximum, whereas the others um, can't. And so that kind of thinking, that kind of logic, that's how gen that's the basis of uh, genetic algorithms, which is going to be your next major programming project, right? Because with genetic algorithms, you're going to have this population, and uh, each one of these is going to be in this population are going to be a state, and then they're going to generate a successor state. You know, um, A naught, B naught. Okay, and then from there you generate another successor state, maybe call it A naught naught, and then uh, B naught naught, right? And then each one of these states gets valued, okay? And you just keep repeating the, you know, going through the generations over and over and over again until you stop. And you'll find that all of these threads tend to convert onto a particular state that has the maximum value. So don't be surprised if that happens. Anyway, I'm getting way beyond the scope of what I want to do here. Um, but it's really important that you understand what's going on with this, how to do this assignment, so that you have a fundamental grasp on what the hell's going on, okay? So hopefully that helped, um, and if you're still stuck, have any issues still, email me and, or hit me up on Zoom, okay? I'll be happy to answer any uh, questions that you might have, all right? Okay, well, we'll see you next time.